Welcome, everyone. I'm Amy Fawn, and I will be your moderator for this one-hour discussion between Suma Kidd and Lisa C. Another reminder that the, at the end of this talk, Sue and Lisa will have the chance to answer a few of your questions. At any time during this program, if you have a question, please type it into the question box located at the bottom bar of your screen, and we will select a few for Sue and Lisa to answer. So I feel like this discussion couldn't be happening at a more appropriate time when the national conversation is focused on how we must, how we must consider other perspectives and experiences in our global history. Both of your books introduce readers to the voices of characters who have often been silenced in history. So my first question to kick this off is how have the recent events with the pandemic and Black Lives Matter influenced your thoughts on your writing and your role as a writer today? And we can start with Sue. One of the most important things to me, actually, is to give a voice to people who are marginalized and silenced, um, who've been left out, made invisible. So that has been something that has been present in my work. But now I feel so strongly that I need to double down on that. I, I feel like we need to take extra care to um, make sure we give voice to those who, who haven't had the chance to have a voice. So I suppose the answer, my answer is it has made me even more committed to that and to feel that more deeply and more strongly than ever. And then I guess I should jump in now. <laughs> I don't quite get how this works, but uh, I, I would echo everything that Sue has just said. Uh, but I would also add that I feel like in my own work, you know, I have all along been trying to find and then tell stories that have been lost, forgotten, deliberately covered up, particularly about women. And so I, I would just again echo what Sue said, that there's this sort of feeling of wanting to double down, to go deeper. And I think looking ahead, I think that's going to be a bit of a challenge for writers like Sue and me, just in the most um, practical sense. You know, I, I have just finished a new novel and I'm starting to think about the next one. And what I had thought I would be writing next was going to require a, a very difficult um, trip into a very remote area of China. Well, there's no way I can do that now. And so I'm just now starting to think about what can I do and how can I do the research given the constraints that we have? So at the very time I wanna double down, I also feel that there, there's going to be a lot of constraints for writers like Sue and me who, who do so much research. And that research can take us, you know, anywhere, but also even the places where, you, you know, certain kinds of archives that might be here in this country might not be open for a very long time. That probably is a great opportunity for uh, the both of you to share a little bit about your research. I mean, that is another common factor I find. These books are incredibly meticulously researched with um, wonderful notes from both of you about how much work you put into making sure that the um, historical accuracies were there while also presenting this in a fictional manner because you have characters that you have created. Um, so could you speak a little bit about your research methods? And we can start with Lisa. So research is my very favorite part of the whole process. To me, it's like this incredible treasure hunt. I never know what I'm going to find. And there are moments when I find something where I just think, oh, oh this is so cool. I'm, I've got to use it. You know? So with the new novel with um, the Island of Sea Women, one of those, an example was uh, that harvesting abalone was and still is one of the most dangerous things that a woman diver can do and is also one of the main ways that she dies. And when I just read that, I was like, oh, I have got to use that. And so then it really becomes a matter 
of where does it go? You know, is it at the beginning? Is it at the middle? Is it at the end? What's the reason for it? What's the ripple effect? So that's just one kind of thing why I love the research so much. But I do research in all the ways that you can imagine. I uh, live in Los Angeles and I spend a lot of time in the UCLA Research Library. I look on the internet to see what I can find. And of course, you have to be very careful with what's on the internet, obviously. But sometimes you can find amazing things. And then I always go to the places that I write about. I try to interview, if it's possible, the people who have lived through that history that I'm writing about. And then uh, last, to talk to researchers and scholars and different types of academics who have spent their whole careers focused on something. Uh, and, and again, for the Island of Sea Women, when I was on Jeju Island, I met a researcher who has spent the last 40 years collecting Henyo diving songs. Well, that, you know, that's a very narrow focus of research for her, but it was so incredibly helpful for me. Lisa, you are, the, as I said earlier, the queen of research. <laughs> I, I'm awed by it all, and I have a word of hope for you. I did not go to Israel or Egypt uh, for the research of this novel, which is primarily where, where it is said. And that was because um, circumstances just prevented me from doing it family circumstances and really the state of the climate over there at the time was a little dangerous. And my family begged me not to go. I had every intention of doing that. And, but then I realized I had been over there 40 years ago. I had traveled almost a month in Egypt and um, in Israel and Jordan and so I thought, could that possibly be useful? It was so long ago. But, you know, those, those uh, memories were vivid in my mind. And so I got my journal out and I kept, I was shocked at the, at the extensive entries I put into that journal with all these descriptions. And all of it kind of flooded back to me. It became very vivid again. And I had the old fashioned slides because this was in 1980. And um, I, I had to dig out the old-fashioned uh, slide projector, and I couldn't believe how much that 40-year-old trip helped me. So, you know, maybe, maybe we don't have to be there. I think it would be better if we could, but the pandemic's going to change the world, and it's going to change how we write, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll just say my research was for 14 months long before I could even write a word. So I'm not very speedy with it. And I got, I don't know if you do this, Lisa, but I got um, lost down rabbit holes and didn't want to stop researching. And my daughter had to do uh, an intervention with me <laughs> about it because I was so, I loved it so much. I mean, you're right. It's, you never know what you'll, what you'll find. And it was very interesting. I, I think when my daughter came in and, and found me researching for the third day Roman aqueducts, she said, you know, mom, you really need to move on and start writing. <laughs> Sometimes you can kind of use it as an excuse to not write. And I probably was doing a bit of that. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> And, but, you know, that's one of the fun things for me. I, I can remember with a um, what book was that? China Dolls, and I thought I had done all the research already. And this is a book that takes place in the mid-1930s in the Bay Area. It has to do with these Asian-American performers and these Asian-American nightclubs. And right in the first chapter, there was a scene where the two girls have come to an audition and, and they go into the ladies room and they change out of their street clothes into their little homemade tap outfits and I just all of a sudden you know I thought all my research is done but here I am in the first chapter and what are they wearing under their street clothes 
because of course back then they didn't have panties like we have today they didn't have bras like we have today the bra had barely been invented and so i just totally went right down the rabbit hole and spent about 40 hours researching women's, uh, the history of you know women's undergarments but i don't know i i, I love the rabbit hole yeah i like it I, I enjoyed it i found some interesting things down there um, yeah. for one thing I discovered these incantation bowls. Um, I did not know about them. And one day I was lost down the rabbit hole and I came upon these amazing ancient bowls in which um, people would write their prayers or their hopes or even curses in a spiraling fashion around and around the bowl. And I was awestruck by it. I mean, I thought, this is what I've been waiting for. And I, need, I, I was looking for a way to start the Book of Longings. And it just wasn't vivid enough, I felt. And I wanted a tangible, visible, um, almost like an icon to hold my character Anna's longings. And there it was. And so I opened the scene with it so that she could have, readers could have a way to really see her longings c contained in this bowl. And, you know, you just find things like that that are treasures um, in research. Um, I, that was my next question was going to be about the rabbit holes in research and you already dived right into it. And so I wonder if you do have, what are the strategies you use? Um, is it, does it require another person to come and kind of pull you out? When do you realize you have enough to write and you have enough that you, you understand where the characters in the plot are going. Um, Lisa? Jeez, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, because I, I think I am an over researcher. I would say that there does come a point sometimes when you're hitting the same material over and over again. It's like, oh, I already know that. Oh yeah, I already know that too. And then that gives you a, at least it gives me a kind of sense of confidence that I have looked under every stone, you know, and, and I'm finding the same things under all of those stones. And then that, you know, like I said, it really gives me the confidence that I really now have found the things that I need. What I would say is when I write my first draft, I'm so attached to what I found that I put it all in there. And, and I write pretty long. And then when I edit, I just keep pulling the stuff out, just pull it out. And I, it, to me, it reminds me of that game um, Jenga, you know, where you have the tower and you start pulling pieces out, but you want to keep it upright. And what I hope is I can pull enough of it out that the structure is still there, that readers know, oh, if I, you know, met Lisa and I wanted to ask her more about fill in the blank, that she would you know, tell me more than I'd ever want to know. But it's just enough to have this, you know, this give this kind of solid feeling without completely overwhelming the readers. I, I don't mean to speak ill of, of um, Michener. I loved those books when I was in high school. But, you know, I can remember like reading Hawaii and the book would just stop for 50 pages about the ge geology of Hawaii. And so that to me is the, is the real thing in the editing is to every time you stop because there is a historic fact, um, you know, and, and you just have to like share all that fun information you found, mm -hmm. that's the stuff that has to come out. I was gonna say the same thing, Lisa, that there is such a, um a pull to use every single thing you research because you invested all this time and effort and you bought all these books and you watched all these documentaries and you want to put it in there. But the trick is to let that be the foundation for you and to be judicious with what you do. I like the Jenga thing. That's pretty nice. Image. Yeah. This idea of a structure and then pulling these things out and it's still being there. I think that is a, a wonderful way to explain to uh, new writers and even writers, you know, in mid-career about how, how to look at our research and how to look at our details. You know, I felt like when I wrote um, The Invention of Wings, which was the novel before 
the Book of Longings. It was about American slavery, and it was set in the 19th century. And I thought of it like a structure, almost like a tower that was really kind of bare bones tower, like a skeleton. And my imagination then had to come in and just hang things on that skeleton and flesh it all out. And writing historical fiction really is a balancing act between history, your research and your history and your imagination mm -hmm. and knowing how to weave those two things together and stay true to the skeletal structure that's authentic, but you've got to use your imagination too. Um, between the two of you, you have amassed an incredible collection of historical fiction. And so I wondered if you can see within each of your projects and your books, how that ratio of research and history and imagination have changed, have shifted um, compared to like your most current book, maybe to your first book. Do you see changes in the way you approach the writing and the development of the characters um, and how you weave into the research? Is it very different from, from the first time you approached such a project? Um, Sue, would you like to start with this one? Sure. Um, I was just thinking, my first novel was The Secret Life of Bees. Mm -hmm. And someone called that, I, I remember very clearly the first time I heard someone call that historical fiction, and it shocked me. Mm. because I was alive then. <laughs> I, I couldn't understand how I could be alive, <laughs> and they called it historical fiction. But, you know, it was set in 1964, and I guess a lot of people weren't alive in 1964. <laughs> so I, had, I didn't have to do a lot of research for that, except look at my high school annuals to see how bad the hairdos were and what we were wearing, and um, because I relied on my memory mostly. I mean, I did have to look some things up, of course, but most of it was just drawing on memories of my little hometown of 3,500 people in Georgia. And that book pulled mightily on that. So I think there has been um, an incredible evolution for me because I kept going further and further back in time. I went from the 1964 to 1980s in the mermaid chair, and then to the 19th century, and then to the first century. So, you know, I'm, I'm going backward, but it's like an archaeological dig. I keep wanting to go back further and further to see where all of this, um, all of these problems started, you know? Mm -hmm. And then for me, I would say, uh, you know, I had, when I wrote Snowflower and the Secret Fan, it was my fourth no, fifth, fifth book. And I wasn't thinking of it as historical fiction at all. And I don't even think my editor thought of it that way. Uh, I, I, but he was so helpful to me. Uh, he was the editor, he just passed away um, this summer, but he was the editor for Maya Angelou and for William Styron and these just unbelievable, you know, lions. And uh, the one thing he said to me when we were editing was he would say, who is this about? You know, it's about Lily and Snowflower. Anything else can go. Mm -hmm. And that uh, what I actually think is if, in terms of my evolution that I really have learned from different editors. And sometimes even when I'm writing, I can, I can hear different editors kind of whispering in my ear, don't do that. <laughs> you're, you're, and, and each editor has a kind of different focus and a different way that they approach editing. Um, so I've learned very different things from different editors. That's, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I do think the term historical fiction can encompass a lot more fiction than we have traditionally considered the term. Like I think of things written with any kind of tie to this reality and our current reality has shifted so much in the last few months. Um, statues are being torn down, 
schools and institutions are being renamed in the wake of this cultural shift. And both of your books offer a deliberate and progressive recontextualization of history um, and challenges the reader to consider how society could be and should be. And so I was wondering how aware you were of this when you were writing. You were writing about characters who, who have been silenced. Um, has, is it becoming more easier um, to want to amplify the voices of these women who have never been able to speak before? Um, and do you think this is a shift that's going to continue? Um, Lisa, would you like to start? Well, I would hope it would continue. I, I hope that this is a moment of real kind of opening, blossoming, um, that we can look at um, other authors that, of, of color that perhaps we haven't read before, that gives us a view into um, their lives and their culture and their experience. But I, I think that that can actually be something that's a little bit more worldwide. You know, no, it, it doesn't just have to be about cultures in America that you can really learn so much about our own lives uh, by kind of connecting to other people, whether they're real or imagined in other cultures and in other moments of history. I, you know, obviously I had wanted to write about these female divers uh, who are on this island off the tip of South Korea. I'd been thinking about it for a very, very long time. And there were several things that prompted me to be like, okay, this is the moment, right? This is how I have to do it now. The main one was that UNESCO had just given them the de designation of an intangible world heritage tradition. And part of the reason they did that was that they were anticipating that this culture was going to disappear within 15 years. So now 10 or 11 years from now. And I knew that these women were in their 70s, 80s, 90s. And, you know, if you want to interview people who are in their late 80s or early 90s, you take a big risk waiting 5, 10, 15 years to go and interview them. But the other thing that happened, and I was already into the book a little bit, was, and again, you know, like, when do you set the novel? For me, I could have had it 200 years ago. I could have had it on a weekend in 2018. But I chose to sort of set it over this long time period because I realized how unbelievably ignorant I was about Korean history and particularly modern Korean history. I, I have a theory that when I was a little kid in elementary school, that by the time the teachers got to that part of history, they were just tired. You know, it was June. <laughs> and then later when I was in high school and college, I think People jumped over the Korean War to get to the Vietnam War because it was happening all, you know, and was just current and we were living it. So the so I just felt like I didn't really know that. And but then after Trump was elected, and if you recall, you know, three and a half years ago, there was a lot of chest beating going on between North Korea and the United States. And you know. I can just remember this one day thinking, you know, if I'm going to die in a nuclear war with this from with this country, I want to know why. Like, I want to know the history of this. I want to know what got us here. And I think the fact is most of us just don't know how, you know, when that chest beating starts happening, we don't know the backstory. And it's really, I think, really important for us to know the backstory, not just about something like that, but in many, many, many different areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, for me, um, I remember the day that it occurred to me to write this novel, The Book of Longings. And I was reading a National Geographic art essay about this scrap of um, a fragment, really, of a papyrus that was titled The Gospel of Jesus' Wife and it was presented by a Harvard professor. Now, this particular scrap fooled everybody. It turned out to be a forgery. Mm -hmm. But the day that I read about it, um, I was really electrified because it occurred to me that if a woman like this existed, if Jesus had actually had a wife, and I assure you, I do not know whether he did or not, but if he did, she has to be the most silenced woman in history. 
and she needed a voice. And um, I just said to myself, I'm going to give her one. So for me, it was like giving the ultimate voice to a silenced woman. And that matters to me. Um, the motifs that are really important to me that recur in my work are about gender and race. And I grew up in the pre-feminist South and in pre-feminist South and pre-civil rights South. Mm. And I know about that intimately. And um, it made a deep impression on me. And um, I think I knew in my early adolescence that I, I always wanted to be a writer. But I remember thinking if I ever wrote a novel, it would be about 1964 because I lived through it. And that's what I did. So I think, um, I think what James Baldwin says, that we have um, combined histories here. White history is not white history and black history, black history. I mean, we all have a history together. Mm -hmm. And I saw that vividly in the South. And I wanted to write about that as, as my witness to it. And one of the recurring lines I put almost in every novel is that there is not a pain on earth that does not want or need a benevolent witness. And as a novelist, I feel like that's part of what we're to do is to witness this pain and give voices to those who are silenced. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Um, that reminds me of also, we're talking so much about the, the joys of the research and the writing and the creation. Um, you also have, you both have um, close relationships with your many readers and they must write to you and they must give you reactions, both fans and critics. And so I wondered if you could speak a little bit about what is it like to, to put a voice in there that hasn't been there before and any challenges you might have faced from reader reactions, from critical reactions, when you are trying to refocus and reposition a history to imagine another voice. Um, we can start with Sue. Well, I know about this. <laughs> um, I did not write the Book of Longings lightly, believe me, because I knew there would probably be some controversy about it. But I felt so strongly, so compelled to do it that um, I just decided I would weather that. And I have gotten some pushback, but it has not been as... Um, strong or as voluminous as I had imagined it might be, um, or they're just being kind not to CC me on the comment. <laughs> or no. But I think a lot of people were nervous that the book might be sacrilegious. Or, but I took a very reverential approach to the life of Jesus. Um, I wanted to portray that message that he had in his life, which was about inclusion, compassion. And so I think there was some, I mean, I did have a woman who told me that all of, all copies of the Book of Longing should be burned mm. and I should be burned too. I mean, literally said that. So that brings up the old, you know, fear of the witch burning thing that goes on. Mm -hmm. But we cannot be intimidated by that. I, I just feel like writing is ultimately an act of courage. Mm -hmm. And you have to have something to say. And you have to have, you've got to have the ability to say it. But by God, what you need is the courage to say it at all. And so, you know, you're going to get that kind of thing. And I got it with the most I ever got it was with The Dance of the Dissident Daughter, which was a memoir I wrote about the collision of my feminism with my faith tradition that I grew up with. Um, so I, you know, I sort of took on my whole religious tradition and I really, I really kicked a hornet's nest on that. But um, this time I was a little more prepared for it, I think. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, you know, I, I just feel very fortunate that 
that I really haven't had a lot of that. Um, I, I would say, you know, one of the reasons I, it took me so long to um, write the island of sea women and decide to write it was I thought, well, you know, I'm not Korean. And I actually kept thinking, okay, I'm just going to, I know someone else is going to write this book. So I'll just let them, I'm just going to wait because I really want to read it. And I can't remember who said this um, but it's, uh, you know some famous writer uh, so I'll just paraphrase but you know to write the book that you want to read that you know isn't out there and I kept looking and kept waiting but I still obviously had a lot of hesitancy I mean I you know the Chinese American stories and the stories that take place in China I, I don't look Chinese but I come from a very large Chinese American family and you know, I, my mom's family was very small. My dad's family was huge. And, you know, so when I was a little kid and I looked around me, what I saw were Chinese faces. What I experienced was Chinese culture, Chinese tradition, Chinese language, Chinese food. And, of course, that's why I have written the kinds of books that I do. But this was different. And that actually made me feel like I have to be even more vigilant with my research. I have to make sure I get every single thing right but also because you know there's been a fair amount of articles and things like that that have been written about these divers but they always ask the same it's like they ask the same five questions and so for me especially when I went there and interviewed people was to just skip over those five questions I know the answers to those five questions and go deeper and to really try as best I could to capture their lives. And, you know, I started out as a journalist and I use those skills. Mm -hmm. uh, but when people have written to me, and, I, and actually I did get one of these letters, emails just the other day, and, and I think she's like number three <laughs> out of my whole career. And what my experience has been is that if I can write, but, you know, not get triggered because, you know, nobody likes to be attacked. Um, but if I can just write back really honestly and sort of lay out what I've done and why I did it the way I did and, and just try to just put it out, then people write back to me and say, oh, I was just, I don't know what was wrong with me. And I really apologize for the tone in my first letter and thank you. And, and then we, we sort of carry on a correspondence for a while. So in the, in the case of the, uh, these divers, you know, who, who has a right to tell that to the, some stories, right? And as I did, you know, again, I thought about this for a long time and this issue was important to me. Um, so first I was waiting, but again, who, who, who's allowed to tell that story? Is it the divers themselves? They're illiterate. Is it their daughters, their granddaughters? Well, they haven't done it. And so if, again, if, if there are only 4,000 of these women left, the anticipation is that they'll be gone in another, at the time, 15 years, then the, you, there's this kind of clock ticking and I really felt that and I thought if I this is the book that I want to read I I want to share this culture and and this experience with other people I before it disappears I really felt that so strongly and so and you know if you think of like a scale that started to really outweigh um, the things that I was worried about and and then it turned out that, you know, the book has been out now, I guess, for about a year and a half, that really only a couple of people have, have brought up this issue. But um, when I've been able to talk to them, they kind of understand where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. I happen to know who said that because I wrote that quote down and propped it on my desk. For It was there for many months, and it's Toni Morrison. That's she, right. Mm -hmm. She said, if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And I thought, okay, well, I have to write this book because I sure do want to read it. And um, I just want to say that um, the controversy it was minimal 
around the Book of Longings. Um, I only heard from, you know, 50 people. <laughs> but it's really not the, the story of Jesus' life. It's not his story. He is a secondary character in this. He is not the hero of this story. It's Anna. And uh, he does not even appear in many parts of the book, uh, maybe less than half of it. Mm. So that was important to me, that it be her story. And the other thing that I think may have been part of the um, leeriness of some readers about it who are maybe conservative religiously, Catholic or evangelicals, was that um, I depicted Jesus as thoroughly human. I was interested in his humanity and treating him as a human being and kind of rediscovering his humanness. So you don't see miracles or resurrections or things like that. Um, he, he's a, a man married to Anna. Mm -hmm. I think um, Jesus's image is going through a lot of changes right now as well in our cultural conversations about the fact that he was actually a man of color who was persecuted by a police state. And it is a very timely thing to consider about who we hold up as idols and what history we hold up. Um, we are, um, we're, we're coming close to being able to open up for um, questions from the audience. Um, I did um, want to follow up on um, these challenges you've spoken about and about hesitations that you feel sometimes about what your subject matter is. Do you still feel like with um, the many changes that are happening in terms of wanting to increase diversity in literature, making sure that there's room for voices of color, how, does it change the way you consider what your next projects are going to be? Um, we can start with Sue. I think it does make me pause and think about it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I was in conversation with Ann Patchett not long ago, and she said a similar thing, and we had a discussion about this. Um, I think it is time to be very discriminating about things like this. However, I have to say, personally, um, I feel like we can't begin to um, kind of decide that I can't write about a man, I can't write in a man's voice because I'm not a man, or something like that. We can take it maybe a little too far. But I think we have to be deeply respectful of other cultures and to make sure that we amplify voices in publishing, mm -hmm. that there are more hirings in the publishing part of it, as well as publishing writers of color. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're going to write about another culture, um, I've written about civil rights and slavery. And I have written in the first person voice of an enslaved woman. If you're going to do that, then you better get it right. Mm -hmm. And you better have your research right. And you better do it with great care and respect and um, do it well. And that's, that's what will save you, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lisa, do you have a, a response to that or any additional thoughts? I would just agree completely with everything that you said. And I think I sort of answered that earlier in the, in the previous question. Uh, maybe the one thing I would add is I think it, it, there's a lot to be said for writers who have, you know, been lucky enough to become best-selling authors or have achieved a certain amount of success to help bring up other writers behind them. And, you know, that's where giving a blurb to a first novel, to recommending, you know, some maybe somehow you meet somebody. Uh, there's a young writer uh, who I actually went to school with my son. And uh, I just really tried as hard as I could to get her an agent. She actually chose the, somebody else. But, you know, to, to help people... Uh, young writers come up 
And I, I would, again, just echo everything that Sue said, the importance of having more people of color, not just as writers, but all the way through the process to have more editors. Uh, my, my own editor, she happens to uh, be the, also the editor for um, Jasmine Ward and also a lot of other black authors. And one of the challenges, you know, some of these relationships she's had for 10, 15 years, but one of the challenges that they've had over the years is finding copy editors who are black, who can actually look at the text and say, oh, yes, this sounds right, this looks right, can, can go into the text in that way, which is not just about where the comma goes or will you please go check this historical fact. It's about language and to have the, the people who really understand the pattern of the language and all of that is just really important. Even though I think when we're looking at this big picture of publishing, you don't, your mind doesn't necessarily go to the copy editor. I think that's both of you brought up some really important points about going beyond just, I think, the, the talking about how we can include and how we can meaningfully bring more diversity in because it's not just about necessarily taking more books, right? It's about making sure that they're included in the entire process. And I think um, Frances McDormand had talked about it in the Oscars when she said inclusion writer, and she spoke about the power that we all have to bring more people up. Um, and so I appreciate that very much. Um, I think uh, we'll take a question from the audience now. Yeah. Um, I have one for both Sue and Lisa. Um, what do you relate to or admire in each other's work? And what question would you have for the other? Oh, can I go first? <laughs> <laughs> I've read all of Sue's books. Uh, maybe not the one, I, I guess not the one about your spirituality, but the, 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 all, the, all of the novels. And what's always struck me is your the way that you weave in the research, the, um, the way in, in historic details, this new, the Book of Longings just has floored me. I'm just so impressed uh, by the writing and also by just so much that I learned. But beyond that part, I, I remember when I first read that you, th this book was coming out and I was terrified for you. <laughs> I just thought the, the bravery and the audacity to take on telling the story of Jesus's wife, I was just like, wow. I mean, I just like, really? Wow. I just, I couldn't believe it. And, and then you have just pulled it off in such an incredible way. But the question I would like to ask uh, I was reading in your acknowledgments at the back or your author's note that you were not, um, uh, you know, in your 20s when you first wrote your first novel. My first book was published when I was 40. And since this is a, you know, a, a conversation mostly about, I guess, our audience, mostly women, that I, I find that interesting that both of us started writing and publishing a little later in, in our lives than, mo than many people. And so uh, we both have that in common. And I just thought that's what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. What brought you to that moment to say, now, you know, now I have to write and I'm going to just, you know, try this crazy thing. Yeah, I know. I think I actually came into the world with some innate desire to write. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was telling people this when I was a kid, and they'd ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would always say a writer. And everyone would look at me strangely because I was in this little town in Georgia where there weren't, nobody wanted to be a writer. And then when it came time for me to go to college, um, I had a failure of courage about it, actually. I lost that little bright light in myself that knew exactly what I wanted to do and what, um, what I should pursue. And I studied nursing because it was a traditional safe path. Now, please understand this was 1966 <laughs> when I graduated from high school. And so um, 
I just chose what they said was a traditional, good, solid thing for a woman to do. And I tried to, you know, go my way with that. It didn't work. I was so homesick for myself, really. And when I was 30, on my birth, my 30th birthday, which seemed like I was getting very old at the time, which is laughable to me now, that I walked into my kitchen where my husband was sitting with our two toddlers, and I made this announcement that I was going to become a writer. And they all sort of looked at me and said, that's great, you know. <laughs> and But I never looked back after that. That was my, not just my enunciation, that was my moment of decisiveness that I, um, I chose a path. And it's because I was so miserable. Um, so I think sometimes um, that drives us to, to remember who we are and what we're about. But I, I had to freelance for about a decade. And I wrote um, several memoirs, spiritual memoirs. Um, but The Secret Life of Bees, my first novel was published when I was 53. So, you know, it's never too late to follow your heart. Okay. So can I, can I ask, Lee? okay. All right. When The Secret Life of Bees came out, I got asked all of these, um, the, well, reporters would ask me to list your 10 top 10 books, you know, or what are the greatest books of all time, according to Sue Monk Kidd, like I knew. And I always put Snowflower in the secret fan because I loved and still love this book so much. And I have read it several times. So I've read all of Lisa's books, actually. Some of them I've listened to on audio. I listed China, China Dolls on audio, I remember, which was um, a great experience. So... Obviously, we like to read each other's work, so we're wonderfully paired today. And I, I, loved, um, I loved this last book, The Island of Sea Women, so much and um, was so happy that she asked me to write an endorsement because it came right from my heart, and I've recommended it to so many people. So I had to get all that cinnamon out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, and thank you for that beautiful blurb. That was so kind oh, of you. Such beautiful words. Yeah, really. You, you really didn't need it, but you got them anyway. Um, I think that what I want to ask you is about what to me is one of your um, towering strengths in writing is about how you write women's friendships. You don't sugarcoat it, and yet you touch I think something deep about the relationship. I'm curious, what, what can you tell me about why that is important for you to write? Thank you. That's an interesting question. So I, I, I am interested in women's relationships, you know, mothers and daughters, sisters, but friendship is the one that I do keep going back to. People often ask me, you know, do I have a friend like in Snowflower or like in this, you know, this uh, new book, uh, The Island of Sea Women, where it's, you know, this lifelong friendship? No, I don't. And actually, I have to say, I don't have a lot of friends. It's so sad because I'm just sitting in a room working all the time. So I don't, I, I've never had that. However, my mother had two best friends sent from um, seventh grade until the day my mother died. So they knew each other for 70 years. And I got to watch these three women my whole life. And then my sister has had a best friend since they were both three months old. So I've gotten to watch that for her whole entire life. So I've, I've had this um, kind of experience of watching these really long, long, long friendships. And I can say that with my mother and Joan and Jackie, you know, over that 70 years, there was one period where 
Joan and my mother, or sorry, Jackie and my mother didn't speak to Joan for about 30 years, but you know, they, one would come and go, but they still remained friends over this unbelievable length of time. And, and we're with her, with us when, when my mom passed away. So I just really had watched that. Now, the reason why I guess I'm so attracted to writing about it is that the women's friendship is unlike any other relationship that we have in our lives. We will tell our friend something that we wouldn't tell our husband, our boyfriend, our lover, our mother, our children. It's a very particular kind of intimacy. And when you're vulnerable like that, when you're open like that, you are also open to being hurt and being betrayed. And so I think for me, whenever I see that kind of dark shadow side of women's friendship, that's where I want to go. Well, I love that because I love to write about women's community, more about women's alliances and how transforming they can be. And in the Book of Longings, there was a relationship between Anna, the, the main character, and her aunt, Yaltha, who was probably the character that was the most fun for me to write that I have ever written <laughs> because she was um, daring and sometimes even vulgar and um, she trespassed everywhere. That's how Anna described her. She, her mind is a feral country that spills its borders and she trespasses everywhere. And I like a trespassing woman, you know, and I think she drew a lot of her fearlessness from her aunt who fostered it. She kind of fanned the flames of Anna's own audacity. Um, so I appreciate um, women's friendships greatly and what the possibilities are of a group of women who come together for good reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that that's also a theme in my books. It's not that I'm only in that dark shadow place, but that, uh, you know, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, that these women are connected through the secret writing system that the women had invented used and kept a secret for a thousand years. Uh, Peony and Love, this the group of women writers in the Yangtze Delta in the mid 17th century who worked together and, and, you know, more women writers who were being published in this one tiny part of China than all together in the rest of the world at that time. Um, China Dolls, you know, the group of women who are working together uh, in these nightclubs, and then, you know, I'm going to not go through every single book, but with the Island of Sea Women, that they dive as a collective, you know, it's about a group of about 30 people. And one reason why I chose to write about friendship in this particular book was that they do follow a kind of buddy system when they dive and so not only is this your closest friend, every time you go in the water, you're, li you're putting your life in her hands and she's putting her life in your hands. It's literally, you know, facing death every time you enter the water. And so not only do you have that friendship that, and that buddy system, but that's within the larger collective of women who are also looking out for each other. Yeah. I, I said in my endorsement of that book that no one does it better than you do. And not just, you tell the whole story, you know, of women. And I love that, Lisa. Thank you. I think we might have time for one last question from the audience. Yeah, this one goes a little bit back to sort of your, your writing method um, and how you two work in the short story form. And if you do write short stories, do those help prepare you for writing novels or did you sort of, are they two separate mediums? Did you jump right into your book and a short story is something different? I can answer that very quickly. I have never written a short story. <laughs> well, I can answer it a little quicker, maybe. Mm -hmm. I haven't either. <laughs> well, that's not entirely true. I never pursued it, but in the, be in the beginning, 
I probably wrote four or five short stories that were published in small literary journals because I was told that was important to do in order to find my voice. I found that not to be true. I found um, that I really liked the long form and that I felt confined by the short story. I love to read them, and I think they are difficult to write, actually. Um, I think a poem is the hardest thing to write because you have to get so much in it, and then maybe a short story. But the long form um, is what I loved. And I'll tell one quick little story. When I wrote the first chapter of The Secret Life of Bees, I was advised by a writing teacher to turn it into a short story, which I did. And it was um, published in a, in a literary journal, uh, Nimrod. And I put it away for three years until I decided I really wanted to write that as a novel all along. And why wasn't I doing that? Why did I listen to him? So I, uh, because I was a novice, that's why. And so we have to, I think, listen to teachers, but we also have to cultivate um, a respect for our own knowing and our own voice and kind of put those together because we have a lot to learn. You know, I'm not an expert. I have a lot to learn and I've listened to editors and teachers tremendously because I considered myself an apprentice when I started writing. And, but even today, you know, having published um, four novels, I still feel like a beginner. I feel like every time I start, I've never done it before. So, it's a blending of, I think, being a beginner and staying in your beginner's mind and also being confident and listening to yourself. Um, I love that. Lisa, do you have any thoughts also about what you do with suggestions that, suggestions or critiques or advice that, when, when, when do you know when to listen and when to turn it off? Well, I'll just sort of maybe shift this to the idea of editing. And then with editing, I always divide it into three. You know, a third, they don't know what they're talking about. They just read it wrong. A third, yep, they're absolutely right. There's something wrong. And then there's that third where you have to talk about it. You And I think as writers, and I'm sure, Sue, you feel the same way, that there are certain times when you've written a scene or something where you know something's off, but you're kind of hoping no one will notice. <laughs> I'm just going to stick that in there and hopefully, you know, I can't fix it. I don't know what's wrong with it, but it's not quite right. But maybe no one will notice. And a good editor always notices. And so what you hope is that, you know, in talking to your editor, I mean, the best editors get you to that place where you know what you wanted to say, where you can clarify what you wanted to say. And that, to me, that's my favorite third, is just, I wanted, I just couldn't quite finesse it myself. And then, and maybe it's because I didn't quite know what I, what I wanted out of it. Um, and then talking with my editor, I can finally get to that. And that, I just love that process. Mm -hmm. Well, we have come to the end of our hour. I want to thank you both so much for joining us and sharing these incredibly wise words. Um, if you would like a copy of the Book of Longings or the Island of Sea Women, there will be a link at the end of the program that you can follow to purchase from one of our indie bookstore partners. I am Amy Fawn, and you've been watching Women Lit Unbound. Mm -hmm.